Thanks for everyone coming out for the uh, special Monday colloquium uh, from the New England area. We have Keith Fortune Whitman, who has many years experience in uh, electronics, synthesizers, computers, computer music, programming, and many other things that I'm sure I don't know about. Many. Many. Not really many. Okay. A couple. A couple. Um, and I think you may want to talk a little bit more about what you're this modular synthesizer because it's the phase I'm going through with many long phases, different kinds of approaches to um, coming up with ways to perform electronic music. And I've chosen this because, I mean, it's a, it's a versatile box. There's a lot of interesting stuff in there, sort of a little bit from every era of electronic instrument design from the 60s on, say. Um, but um, I'm using it right now because it's... Um, trying to go for a clean break from computer-based performance, from everything being in the box, um, software, Max MSP, you know, obviously doing a lot of things with controllers and things to make it more performative. I've just been very frustrated with it for like, you know, maybe five, six years now, so. Whereas I started getting this stuff to um, explore more sound design kind of concepts, um, just have a basic toolkit of analog, um, some, you know, early digital stuff. Um, I got more into the idea of actually making a complete sort of performance solution with it. And it's the whole thing revolves, this, this setup revolves around actually like performance of music. Um, so my launching off point was, um, I saw, maybe I don't know how many years ago, but I saw this guy Milford Graves playing New York as a free jazz percussionist. It was incredible, it was a mind-blowing experience. He was doing all this stuff that was polyrhythmic and free and sort of asynchronous, but when you looked at everything all together, it was like this beautiful Murray effect where all the detail just kind of coalesced into this great sort of collected rhythm set. It was more like timbral than really anything rhythmic. And that kind of this idea really stuck with me since that concert where you create music that has a sort of a greater timbral effect out of just micro, you know, little tiny sounds that are rhythmic in and of themselves, or percussive sounds, iterative sounds. So my approach in, in coming up with a performance you know, piece for this thing was to have this, at the core of it, just completely asynchronized uh, music to start with random rhythms, or things that are sort of somewhere between pure random and uh, what you'd recognize as sort of a rhythm set, polyrhythms, uh, subdivisions, things like that. And uh, it's, it's a tricky thing. I mean, it's a tricky thing to do in computers, any sort of random. I mean, there's ways you can implement random algorithms and things. but. Um, the core of the analog synthesizer is analog, it's noise, it's something that's un unquantifiable, it's um, pure randomness, and you can sort of tap into that with these systems and make something that's purely, in a, in a, in a way, is purely random, more pure than, say, the way that a computer would derive random. So, um, yeah, I've just been getting a lot deeper with it, and um, at home there's something that kind of resembles the giant emu um, downstairs that's, you know, the wall, wall of stuff, but um, a lot of it's extraneous, a lot of it's things that I use every now and then, and I really just had this idea to focus on the things that I'm using, the subsets of patches that I'm using the most, just cram them in this orange box that, I mean, the form factor is great because it, I can travel with it, it fits on the airplane, you know, I close it up, it, it's just the right size so I can get it on an airplane. 
travel around with it. Um, but I was then leaving a lot of a lot of things at home that I would use. You know, if I had my druthers, this size wasn't an issue. I'd be bringing them with me. So um, probably the best way to approach this, rather than do this really formalized thing, is just have everybody come up and we'll just you know have a nice pack here, and I'll just start at the top and I'll build something and sort of explain much better in practice than I will be able to in theory what exactly I'm doing. So everybody come up. four speakers around, and for the last like maybe two months, I've been really getting into this idea of you know where there's aleatorism in the music, there could also be this thing in space where there'd be speakers around. It's actually kind of easy to to ask somebody just to get like two extra speakers, like play the rock club, and be like, do you mind if I put two guitar amps in the back of the space or two whatever little cubes? Or, I kind of like like playing where it's the, all, all four speakers are completely different classes. One will be like a bass amp, and one will be a tiny little battery powered thing, you know. And then playing around with moving the sounds, you know, how the speakers themselves color the, the sound. So you can see this thing is like slowly sweeping here. That's just a great visual analogy of what's going on with visualization. So there's what's called a quadrature oscillator. That actually, in this case, is an eight way oscillator. It gives you a sine wave and then it gives you an output for every 45 degree division of the entire 360 degree spectrum. So I can tap into the phase of a sine wave, zero degrees, you know, as it's going up, starting at zero. And then I can get the 180, which is exactly the same frequency, but going down, you know, and they kind of cross each other like that. And then every sort of 90 degree thing. So when you look at it, it's great. I mean, that's like the best example you can see. It's, you know, as this one fades out, the next one fades in sort of even energy. So it gives the appearance of the sound actually moving in a circle around the room. Now it doesn't have to be a circle, it can be a figure eight, it can be sort of things that, you know, that can change the individual values of which speaker is getting which volume, but you know, with everything that's set to zero, <coughs> the effect is the thing moving around the circle. Yeah. Synthesizer is pretty much being clocked by a single output that's coming out of a module here that's built by this guy Scott Yeager called the uh, Zorlan Cannon, and the name is like a reference to it. Um, what game is it? Chris, you probably know this. So, um, no, I don't know. It's Atari 2600 game. Wizards of War. Yars Revenge. Yars Revenge. Yars Revenge. Yars Revenge. Yeah. So it's the chip in this is the actual sound generative chip from the Atari 2600. So it's the exact. I mean, it's just they took the chip out of 2600. And it's intended to give you all of that in like patches that you can hear I'm talking about. If you're familiar with those early video games, this thing gets into the uh, dead, which just sounds like. Like combat, you know, playing a, you know, any 2600 game. A four bit pitch noise, five bit pitch noise. You know, any one of those old early 80s games with like crowd noise. The, the design of it is that it's based on this one chip. And the side effect is that, you know, to generate these sounds, it uses what's called a, a digital chip register. And you get all of these beautiful clock outputs, which are fairly random. You know, they're sampling whatever bit depth of noise is being used to generate the, the tone here. And then you have all the individual gate outputs. But what I will love is that it has a single master clock output that's, you know, powering the entire thing. And then they give you, right at the, right next to it, they give you a thing that lets you basically use the clock that's generating rhythm to influence like influence more randomness into into itself basically. So at every tick of the clock it, it looks at a voltage that's coming in and it decides if it's gonna speed up or slow down at every single clock. So um, what I've been doing with it is, you know, to start at the top, I take I give it a, a random voltage. So at every every time it's a clock it, it samples uh, literally analog white noise coming out of a module right here. So I'll patch it in just to show you Mold it because what I want to do is have as many copies of this, this master clock as I can. So you know, I'm thinking it's what's called a buffer call. It literally is an envelope follower, it, I mean, a voltage follower. It gives you exactly the same voltage out that you're putting into it. Unlike a passive one where every time you copy it, you're kind of using a little bit of uh, voltage. But this one's really great because it just gives you exactly the same. So you can 
clock, put it into a trigger, and we take the, it's got a built-in noise generator and a sample in one tiny module, so take that out. We'll, um, we'll make a copy of that, because we want to have, we'll use this voltage in other places, so another buffered malt up there. And then all we do is we feed that back in, and then you can see automatically the clock sort of just seems like it stopped. It's just that one light just stuck. And what's going on now is that whatever value it's getting is a really low value, so it's like making the clock almost imperceivably slow. As you turn down how much influence is going in, you start to see a straight rhythm there, like blinking Christmas lights. So it seems da 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 And then you, as you influence it, you can get these long pregnant pauses that sort of erupt into bursts of activity. Glass that flicker violently, <coughs> and it basically just freeze. And in saying Milford, when I did it, was what really struck me the most is this thing about how it was this concentrated bursts of energy. One, one section of the piece that I saw, and he would have these like just it would stop, and there's this beautiful just sustain. You know, when you ever think about seeing a solo percussion concert, and there's sustain drums, you know, ring out. Even even not cymbals, but actual like, drums ring out in a beautiful way. So I wanted to have the system where it's kind of like it was making a lot of light speed choices that I mean I could never do just literally sitting here playing the instrument, you know, it kind of like it makes a lot of these decisions for me um, in a way that I think is musically useful. And I've learned how to sort of tinker with it and tailor it and taper it and, you know, run it through things like offsets and attenuators to get, you know, different kinds of results. And I can really sit here and just kind of tweak it out in a way that it's very gratifying to me to have that source of it. So um, we'll start it here that it's, that rhythm is actually doing something. So we'll attach the trigger into this module here, which is basically all it's doing is getting an input from a digital oscillator and it's triggering an oh, envelope the second it gets it. So the same thing we were just listening to. So we'll make it more like a click so you can hear. So yeah, right when that stops. You get lost and you don't connect one cable and you're totally boned. So, so there you go. There's the there's straight time. A little bit of influence. I call this like the drum so This is like it's just kind of like traveling a little bit in either direction, not doing much. A little bit. You start hearing it kind of stumbling over itself. And then you start getting into that zone where there's That's what, what starts everything. So with that one clock, I can generate like, I mean, I start with just a one rhythm set. And then, uh, you know, it's already sampling some white noise here, so I'm getting a constantly changing voltage that's, you know, within the range of this instrument. Roughly it's, you know, negative five volts to positive five volts. Um, and it's just completely aleatory. There's no, nothing's being quantized. There's no usable, no ranges. It's all between the cracks. It's all kind of all over the place. But it's it's completely random. That's what I love about it. So from there, from here, we kind of take it and we taper it in a little bit, and we're going to do a lot of stuff with it. So that one sound, for example, that we were getting just that one, you know, mono note. Let's say we'll we'll gen do something so that it changes the pitch of that. Just working broadly in ranges, not really working with note values per se, but we want to pitch up, pitch down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take start with the, the clock here, and I'm going to um, patch it into this thing that's an analog shift register. So it's a um, bucket brigade. I mean, the best way to look at it is that it takes this, this value it's getting. Every time you give it a clock, it pushes that value to the next output. So say you give it one, two, three, four, right? As soon as you get the one, it's you know, at the first output. As soon as you give it a two, the, the, the two goes to this output. It pushes the one to the next output. It pushes them down the line. So already we get this great cascading series of voltages. So I'll just copy it like so. Clock right in the top there. Um, we'll give it, there's another output that's also just white noise right here. I'm going to take the same thing. 
and put it in there. So we already got one, two, three, four. And then right next to this ASR is a, a bank of the same buffer multiples. So we've got five inputs, each input copies to three outputs. So going down the line, we just take them and, you know, so that we're already, we have this kind of cascading series of four voltages. We can apply that to any human system. So this is usually where I start kind of paying attention to what ca color cables I'm using because it's really easy to get lost. As you'll see in about 10, 20 minutes, it'll just be almost impossible to get in there and get to the, the knobs. But for the most part, I don't have to. It's kind of just letting it do its own thing. So there we go. Blue, red, green, yellow. Right, so there we go. So as that's happening, we should have all those values coming across. We'll take the first one, the blue one, and we'll give that to the pitch. Right, sorry, we should hear this. So we're doing some Pac-Man stuff right now, right? The random a little bit. Right, so it's moving around. We can try to change the range locally in the, in the oscillator itself. That's pretty corny. It sounds like, you know, sort of every random synthesizer sound effect. Or, you know, it's just doing totally arbitrary sounds, right? Where the fun begins is that we start to play around with, you know, the, say the, the length of this um, this sound. It's Right now it's just doing the same pump, 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 you know, no matter what. But it's because we're, we're generating the, the, the value that's randomly, um, you know, changing the, um, the length of each note. We already have we have access to it. So let's say we'll take that exact value, we'll invert it so that you know a high voltage will make a longer. I mean, a high voltage will make a shorter decay time, and then a low voltage will make a longer decay time. So that you know we can play around with it, but it basically will start tracking. You know, so that when there's a long pause, the note will sort of sustain for a longer time, and the short ones will just sound like crackle. So <coughs> we trace back, find that. <coughs> Right next to this, the little bank here, there's two of those buffered multiples in a row, and there's a thing called a quad inversion. But literally all it does is it takes positive values and makes it negative and negative value and positive, sort of flips it across the uh, across the boundary, across the center. So right away we should hear going into this thing. All I'm doing is I'm patching it in. This is a very complicated module. I could probably sit and talk about it for an hour by itself, but it's computer controlled. Um, envelope generator uh, and a voltage control amplifier and a mixer kind of all in one and then it's actually the wave shapes or or on a, on a digital wave table so right now I'll just start with like a basic you know logarithmic cutoff so already we should hear it as like so it's a really quick one to just like a click a little just transient and as you for a bit. All right, so already it's like it's getting a little more interesting sounding, but I'm going to take it now the, the next down the line, the next voltage. And um, brilliant thing about this is that it's a this is also a digital wave table oscillator. I've got the main output is actually two voices, and you can have this voltage here controlling which actual you know um, what wave shape it's using, and it's great because it's slowly instead of just like digitally flipping through them, it's sort of very gradually morphs between all the waveforms. So. When you get it really rolling, you can hear all this really nice development with um, the actual shape of the wave itself. So it's in a really long sort of stuck cycle right now. And the only thing you can do as a performer is just kind of nudge it a little bit, remind it what it's doing. So to take the pitch out so you can see the difference. In, uh, so here it's kind of going up in a harmonic series. like a filter opening and closing, it's getting harmonics and closing. That, I believe, that's the middle bank. The top one is more aggressive. So it's doing this also a kind of filtering effect. Like sawtooth waves, some sound more like pulse waves, or kind of getting down to sine waves, just pure, you know, a, a single fundamental. And then I'll patch the, uh, the pitch back in. Which I see I've already lost track of where that is, so it's very easy to get lost. So 
it's already starting to do something that's it's getting a little, a little more complicated and more interesting. So this is a, also a great artifact of this is that even as I turn off the randomness, like how it's affecting the clock, I still have access to all the random values, even if they're not actually changing, you know, speeding up and slowing down the clock in itself. You can still hear it's, it's changing and moving around. So, so notes are still getting shorter and, and, and uh, longer. The wave shapes are still changing. Okay, so we're just getting a little more interesting. So the next step is, I'd like to implement a little um, FM, so frequency modulation of this oscillator. So right now it's just doing a note, it just bonk, 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 and it's just notes. So we'll give it, this is an LFO right here, you get a nice little visual cue of what it's doing. It's quite slow right now, so it's, you know, going back and forth. We'll give, um, we'll give that with the next voltage down the line. And we'll catch that into, um, just right into the FM input of the oscillator. And you should immediately hear that it's making a difference. I've also got this on a control on the module itself. Okay, it's too short. So yeah, so here we go. Okay, so right now it's just the note. Bring up the FM. So every click of the clock. So some some zingy zapping kind of low, low frequency sounds. Every tap of the clock. This is getting a different speed. Exponential input, so it's going from quite slow to almost getting into audio range. Speed this up, so we get really into some nice. So there's you sort of get more of the core of like a nice like audio range sound. same value because again they're being pushed down like this so it's some random values in there so I can listen to this personally for hours I mean I'd sound like music to other people but I mean, this is like a really great for sounds and right now let's say the panning is just moving around in a static a very slow pan around the room um, you can already go ahead and say when it gets a high value up here it'll speed up how fast it's panning or slow it down so it's just going around in a circle Down here, FM input. So you can see it's flashing quite quickly at some high values, really like very quickly around the room. And then it'll sort of lock it a little frequently and kind of stop somewhere. So every now and then it gets a really slow one, it sounds like a goofy, you know, a slow scheme. Example, that's like I'll consider that an instrument. Like I could sit here and I can play this. I can again play around the clock, the frequency, you know, how much FM it's getting, the speed of the FM, how much it's controlling those wave shapes. All of that stuff is, you know, a, a, something that I consider as a performance gesture. It's, you know, even though it's, you know, generally it's automating its own control information. It's taperable in a way that I, I like to kind of play around with it. So maybe I'll start around with a low, low section of frequencies and kind of build up to mid range and kind of change the volume, you know, change the curves. I've got all this control over how how it's being generated. Really, I can really just speed it up and just you know, control nonsense. I can slow it down, just barely nothing, long pregnant pauses. Well, that's great. All right, so now that we've got sort of the control section up and running, um, the sky's the limit. I can really just sit here and apply that to anything else in the synth. So the next, that's kind of like, a, say this voice is our like uh, 80s, you know, uh, late 80s wavetable digital voice, you know, maybe like Yamaha synthesizer or something. Um, uh, the next sort of section of it is right here I've got all these analog oscillators, six of them all. 
clustered together in there. Right next to it, the guy built this sort of, um, I think of it as ring modulator, even though the circuit's more closer to the way that telephone signals are kind of muxed and demuxed in a telephone line. So um, it's got, you know, a, it's totally passive. There's no power going to it. The only power it gets is just the two oscillators, the voltage going into this thing, and then you get, if, at the end, what it approximates a ring modulated signal, but instead of being both the upper and the lower sort of artifact, it's just one. It's just the, the upper on one and then the lower on the other. I believe that's probably the best explanation of how that works. So start with just you know a sine wave going into this thing. So there's a carrier and then a modulator, just like any other modulator. And then we'll, we'll listen to just the actual sound of it so we get an idea of what it sounds like. This sort of like harkens back to the real, like the earliest, you know, um, you know, 60s analog synthesizer type sound. Right, you get all that cool side men on, you get all this interesting artifacts going on in there. Right? And then, you know, like I did before, we'll patch in a couple of voltages from our little voltage maze down here. So that every time the major clock, the master clock starts going, we get a little change. That's just the one voice, you know, being modulated against a, a static wave, and then there's both voices being modulated. Right? Now, this is a particular class of sounds that I really like. I mean, it, other than just the, the sound of listening to two waves playing, you know, two pitches or arbitrarily, you get that combination tone as well, so it starts to get more of this kind of polyphony aspect. And you can really just sit here and just taper the range and you build these beautiful sounds that the closer the two oscillators are the pitch, the, the, the lower frequency the, the combination tone is, the, the different tone. And the wider they are apart, the higher the tone you get. But, so in and of itself, maybe kind of like a you know, cliche, sort of like 50s sci-fi sound or you know something like that. But um, it's interesting. So moving along with it, we'll take um, just that raw sound by itself. Put into it is a, a pair of BCAs right here, dual control amplifiers, and we'll give it say just like a triangle wave, just you know, so that it's there's an attack and a decay going down the line. Before I get too lost with this, there's two outputs here. I'll combine them right here. This one module, which is a, basically an analog delay, but it has two inputs. We'll give you the output there. So you can hear it. Actually, we'll do. They listen to it first. slowing down in a way that's not too dissimilar from this, but it's um, much narrower range. It's really kind of staying in roughly the same range. So there's both voices going at once right now. You can hear they're not really synchronized because even though we're using the, the master clock to control this, it's actually, it's getting a push down the line voltage, so it's getting maybe the third or fourth iteration of the, of the same, you know, timing information. This one got four steps ago, so it's actually never going to be perfectly synchronized. Right. If I want, even at this stage, I can already because there's there's many many inputs. Right now, I've got this is a sub mixer right here. I'm plugging everything in just a mix, literally a mixer. <coughs> you know, it's a input panning it left and right. Um, I'm going to take something that say, say the other the, the right side of that mixer and just plug it right into the thing that's making the quad happen. 
and we'll give it, say, the opposite of what the first channel is getting. We'll give it this, you know, the, the 45 degree out of phase, the four values. They're still, again, they're, you know, 45, 225, 135, 315, so they're still making a complete circle of 90 degree out of phase values. But instead of going, say, clockwise, we'll go counterclockwise, just arbitrarily make them seem different. that is we have control over that first voice, the second voice, whether they're going, say, clockwise around the room or counterclockwise. So it's four cables, one for each degree, one for each value. And you can already start seeing it. It's, it's uh, doing the same speed, but see how they're sort of going in opposite directions. The, these, the top row is going right, the one is going left. Right, so there's both of them in the same channel. Now we'll, we'll flip them. So pretty much, they're not, they're not perfectly out of phase. They're, they're crossing over each other, every circle. And they're actually not 180 degrees because we're using the 45. They're like 135 degrees. Please think of them like, they're like this, but going around, and when they resolve, they're always exactly the same distance apart. So we do it really slowly. And kind of get the effect. set of voices very quickly because there's there's two channels and there's, there's six oscillators so I'll build you know the other the other voice so it'll be crazy you know double ring modulator action going on over here so same idea you know triangle sort of a falling triangle way of controlling the, the volume say a second voice. Now, so far this is we've got, you know, an analog voice, very 50s, 60s sounding. We've got this sort of 80s digital voice. Um, and it's actually even, that's being run through. Just a straight up delay. Let's say we'll just grab 
something that randomizes the delay time. Sine waves being modulated run through a delay line, or yeah, analog delay line. Um, now from here it sort of gets kind of more fun. There's um, so let's say that's the base of our our, our sound. One voice, the second voice. Um, we'll see. So we'll take that voice, the the sci-fi one. We'll run it through the same the other channel. This is a two-channel um, a VCA you know envelope generator down here. We'll give it its own channel. Same clock, you know, that triggers the main patch is getting this. So. Every click. Now both voices. Perfectly insane. Still doing all the subtle modulations and pitch changes going on right here. But the cool thing is now that we have this going, we've got a common output, and then we can start running that through all of the more contemporary stuff in the system. I and mean, what's cool about this whole format is that, yeah, there's a lot of throwback stuff. There's a lot of things that are based directly on mode, Bukla, Surge, designs. But we've got things that are kind of like contemporary digital versions of old analog tech. Like, for example, the Phonogen here is Tony built this, named it after this beautiful instrument that uh, Pierre uh, Schaefer made, GRM that's a tape machine with a keyboard. And you can actually have, you can play the speed of the tape machine, you know, chromatically. Um, while this um, maybe isn't, you know, it's always not as bulky as a giant tape machine with, with 12 tape heads, and it was a very complicated thing and very hard to maintain. They don't have a working version of it there now, but this is basically just like a digital memory unit, you know. So I've got, I can copy this sound, I can run it directly into that, and then have control over just like a sample, like a buffer. So very similar to a computer approach, a maximum SP approach, where, you know, Sound goes into it. Um, once it's been recorded into the buffer, you can manipulate it with pitch. You can do neat granular things, you know. Um, it's a very, very versatile module. It's very, very unique. And something that's very playable. So right there. So right there is our, everything that's going into this. We'll put the back on and make it a little more interesting. So this is a 
very getting to something that's very much like a sort of computer era approach to sound, you know, microsound, tiny little slices of sound. And it, in a way, it directly contrasts this like 50s space age, uh, atomic age, ring modulator approach. So I think kind of like having both in the same toolkit allows you a lot of freedom. Sort of kind of things, you can now use it more like a traditional delay. Um, similarly, there's another one over here, I won't get into it, but it's 8-bit, um, you know, very grungy 8-bit mono, so like 11K sample module where you record a sound into the buffer, you have control over the loop points beginning and end, <coughs> you can change direction, you can flip it, you can change the sampling frequency to change the pitch, all that stuff, so that's going on. So, that's kind of at the core of it, I mean, it's really like, um, it's a deep enough toolkit that I can, I mean, I'm, when I'm playing, I mean, sometimes I'll patch everything up and really only just focus on a very small segment of it. Say I'll just use the digital or just use the analog. If I have a longer time to sort of really sit and, and patch it and play around with it, sometimes I'll just run the gamut. But mostly it's like anything, you know. You bring your guitar to the gig, you don't, you know, play power chords the entire time, you know. Or if, say, if you're a gigging musician, you do GB gigs and you play in a metal band or whatever, it's like you run the gamut. And I'm trying to build it so that it's, it's versatile enough so that I have enough control over things. Now, so far everything's been just purely abstract, nothing quantized, nothing um, remotely approaching music per se, like, you know, like meter actual music. So I can just as easily patch it so that the clock is in time, you know, the, the notes are being uh, quantized, like this little keyboard right here. Um, and I can dial in note values, you know, and uh, make sure that this random spray of, of sounds are actually being quantized to notes. Um, yeah, I can actually do that pretty quickly. That's, that's a nice sound. So. Instead of getting arbitrary value right here, we'll have something that's called an offset attenuator, so that you know it basically just narrows or broadens the range. And we'll listen to what that sounds like. So I'll turn all that off. Just listen to the original sound. <laughs> Step, it's randomly, I'm going to get the full range here. It centers in on the closest or the root or fifth in the octave of the valve, the control voltage valve. So, yeah, pretty simple. And I can do things like I can play with the offset, what octave it's running in. Still doing all that stuff where it's automating the. Um, Wave shape, uh, the decay times, all that stuff still happening. And I can make it, I can bring it back into free. Same panning. <laughs> 
matrix, and then the other side, an effect. interface where you can plug into so any guitar pedal opens up a whole other world of interesting stuff you can run any sort of you know interesting hack or circuit bed stuff that people have built that have to tune in and out you know distortion pedals any classic you know studio effects people have designed you know studio effects for this format but um, I'm not super into them as there's not too many that are like they, they sound this good I mean obviously I'm using a, a crap example of the digital pedal but it's um, you know, something very nice and convenient about having this thing that's outside the synth that you can just send sound to. I mean, if you have a really long decay or something, you can, you know, send to it, let it run, and have it going on its own while everything else is still happening. It's a nice dynamic. So, like, you know, you can do like traditional dub effects, you can send to a pedal, have a little bit of a there. track across notes that I really enjoy that. It's, it's interesting. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much the, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, if anybody wants to play it, just go right ahead and play it. I'll just leave it right now. And I probably have to answer some of your questions, but that's, uh, that's my talk. That's all I got. Yeah. Any, other, any specific questions? I mean, I, before <laughs> I should have asked, does anybody have experience using this stuff? Before I <laughs> so I started spraying out all that you know, for, for an hour. But um, I assume you all have had some experience with that. Yes? Could you talk a little bit more about what you see the difference in the so called randomness? Oh, yeah. Uh, software and this yeah. machine. Yeah. Of course, yeah. That's, I mean, that's a huge sort of ethical thing, I think, in some way. Or, um, yeah, I mean, they, the ways I always did it on a computer were like, you know, just pick some random thing, like it would be looking at the time, it would see the random generator or weather patterns or wherever I was playing and stuff like that. You have to put some kind of real world thing into it. Like I noticed that the first time it really sunk in was um, I was doing a lot of music with like, uh, you know, Commodore 64, like old computers, and I, there was a great emulator that someone had built for Mac. And um, I wrote all these codes to sort of randomly peek and poke the chip, you know, like running it virtually, you know. And uh, I noticed, like, the, the emulator, every time I ran this code, it would be exactly the same, exactly the same rendering of it, because it was always deriving the same, in the same way, you know, before that I hadn't really thought about it. Uh, whereas if you type, you know, the code into an actual Commodore 64, it would always be completely different. And what was the difference? They're both computers, they're both digital, you know. Why was the Commodore 64 always doing something different, and the, the emulator always doing something the same? So um, I think it, it boils down to how the emulator was coded, you know, whatever calls it made you random different than the way that the actual hardware did itself. And that's like, it's interesting when you think about it, it should be exactly the same. The only thing analog in the Commodore 64 is the, the filter on the chip, right? And I was, Well, yeah. I mean, the, the way you usually generate random numbers yeah. in software is you start with a seed. Right, that's, yeah. And then yeah. It's, it's an algorithm, and the problem is that if you always start with the same seed, right. it always follows the same sequence. So you get a kind of a, a random distribution over time, but if you think of it in terms of, say, a sequence, yeah. of numbers, then obviously you, you have a big problem, whereas yeah. if you're looking at thermal noise and amplifying it, right. using a sample and hold, the sort of old-fashioned tradition, uh, you do tend to get more, you get non-sequential, you, you get away from the sequential problem. Right. But okay. that being said, you can write your own seeds, and you can, right. you can insist on a different seed every time you launch it, or you could write your own algorithms. Yeah. That's what I meant, like when I was saying I was sampling the weather conditions or the temperature. That was we would like, you know, Max would you know look at right. so an API that would grab information real time, actual natural information, and use that as the seed to feed a random generator. But again, it's like if it generates the same seed, 
somehow arbitrarily. It's gonna, you're going to get the same sequence. That's just the way they always work. You know? Obviously, you, know, you can come up with an infinite number of seeds to feed an infinite number of random number generators, but ultimately, they're going to repeat. You know, ultimately, I mean, 1,000 years from now, 10,000 years from now, there's <laughs> something that's generating a random sequence is going to generate the same sequence because computers ultimately don't do random. They do on or off. I mean, you know, like, this is like a grand you know, generalization, obviously. You know more of this than I do, but that's just the way that I see it. Whereas all of the shit that happens with this before I even turn it on, I mean, with the actual voltage coming into the high noise generator, I mean, it's going to be always like, you know, infinitesimally different no matter what I do, even if I patch it exactly the same way, in the same place, the same, you know, a minute after I start doing it, the same conditions, it will always be different. That's just the nature of how noise is generated, and, you know, it's noise, it's actual noise, instead of, you know, a digital version of what noise is. So. Uh, anything else, or? And I really mean it's cool, just if you want to stick around for a minute and play it, that's totally fine. I'm not going to record this thing, just it's fun to get in there and figure out what's going on. Um, so yeah, please do. I have a question. Yeah, about course, when you yeah. opened up, you sort of talked about, or at least the way you're using the system now, the origin of it being this kind of performance that you were really in, you know, impressed by um, yes. and sort of trying to infuse what you were doing or maybe saw some of the problems of working with a laptop performatively yeah. um, and to kind of use that experience as a springboard like into this kind of system. Mm -hmm. What do you think about, obviously the interface is very different, but I'm wondering how as you're understanding performance, if it's if it's something in terms of you creating something in real time that has the ability to change and be very different from night to night because while the interface is still very different, I, I'd say a lot of people probably look at this and can understand it as much as they could understand somebody doing something behind the veil of a laptop, right. you know. Right. The system is still like a foreign body for most people that are from the outside. Yeah. Um, definitely not exactly the okay. same, but so is it, do you, as the performer, is that why it's really important, or has become important to you? It's in some effect. I mean, this is just as alienating from uh, from a stage perspective, seeing it just from there. You know, it's just this blank with the box. Um, there are, I mean, not to get into a whole side conversation, but there are mitigating socioeconomic factors about traveling with an Apple computer that is trying to be crazy. Right now. Right. So <laughs> I don't, I generally, um, you know. Something about this community of people, um, I know all of these guys. Like, I mean, the guy that built the case, um, most of the guys that actually built these modules were people that I had dialogues with when they were starting up, and I was like, this is fascinating, you guys are not just the cloning of the classic circuits, but all the forward-thinking stuff, all the chip stuff, all the, you know, and that it all is using the same voltage and the same format, you know, everything plays nice together. Um, and when it all came together, I mean, for years it was just dope for, you know, for decades, making this Eurorack format, you know, which is based on the Roland System 100, it's all the same, you know, voltage stuff. But when this kind of real third-party thing started happening, this largely focused in the US, um, it got really interesting. And um, it, it's again, it's something about the sort of mom and pop aspect of it. I mean, the guy that built this orange case was like, you know, I'm, I'm like, can we find a way that I can fit the maximum amount of shit in this box and still be able to bring it on the airplane? He took it as a challenge, you know, he kind of was like, okay, we can pull this off. And then he, you know, he made a couple to try them out, and I've had this one for a couple of years now, it's great. Every couple of weeks I have to kind of take it apart, you know, screws fall in the back and, you know, the power Boards get wiggly and stuff, and I have to kind of take it apart and put it back together again. But you know, he puts them into production, and like you know, he's already got the little cottage industry going based on this you know basic idea of being able to bring a synth in an airplane. So that like that aspect of it is like super cool to me. It's yeah, just the same as like the guitar pedal thing from like ten years ago. Everybody started making these boutique guitar pedals. It's the same idea, only much deeper, and you know, getting into everybody not so much competing with each other is actually playing nice, and that like is a super great thing. It's not always common in music technology to have a lot of different yeah. developers actually like. Agreeing on a spec and then going for it. So, All right. I, I uh, yeah. don't think it's a subtle difference uh, from a performance perspective of having a laptop, yeah. especially in alienation from the audience, and then actually having the, the briefcase and the, yeah. you know, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. knobs. I mean, it seems, yeah. Um, it's, little, yeah. you know, drastically. It's not drastically different. I'm just saying. No, I'm saying it is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Some people just see it as another alienating thing that makes sound in some mysterious way. I mean, you know. Um, like you a know. violin. Yeah. Exactly. Like anything. You know, like piano. You know, complicated acoustic instrument. Um, um, yeah. There's. I mean, I I get off on it. What more can I say? It's. I mean, coming from doing everything on computers, I and mean, I grew up with. 
Commodore 64s and all this stuff. And I just like you know, everything I did for the first 20 years was making music as a kid, you know, programming, everything was programming. You know, I realized, you know, I was putting together this computer music system and it was like, you know, getting all this extraneous stuff outside of the box to basically have a way to, you know, use physicality to interact with a thing, you know, a software system. And like half of this is software, I'm not gonna lie to you. It's like, I mean, half of it's digital. It's the same idea, you know, just, you know, converting analog to digital, back out to analog again out the front, you know. Um, and I could probably, if I put my mind to it, sit down and build, you know, three quarters of this next MSP, you know. But I don't want to. I want a guy that really is like, you know, that's part of a system, part of a solution, you know, for like putting these ideas out there. And I kind of want like, I want to help that guy out. And then I get it and I'm like, it's maybe not the way that I would build it myself. It's actually a collaboration with somebody else. You know, it's their sensibilities in the hardware panel. You know, that I really like. I mean, you know, when Scott was building that, you know, the, the Atari Twenty Six Hundred module, um, I was like, great, I can make you know gross combat music, and I can make gross Space Invaders music. That's going to be amazing. I'm excited about that. You know, and then he was like, oh, but you know, he was like so uninterested in the sound. He was just like, who cares about the sound? It's you know, it's all the digital gates. It's the pitch noise. You know, like you can use this as control information. I was just like, uh. <laughs> Look at it. It's you know, it's a tiny little thing, and it does all. It's like powers this entire rig, basically, you know, in some way. Um, and that's cool. So yeah. Um, and I'm not, like, I mean, I, I I built super highly specialized software systems that were like the thing that I wanted to do for so long, and I got really biopic about. You know, it was like just this very idiosyncratic performance solution that I built, and I realize now that it's it's kind of um, this is real trial by, trial by fire stuff. It forces me to go outside of my element a little bit, really understand someone else's perspective and try to maybe integrate that into my system or not, before I just don't use it. You know, this is the stuff that happens that I happen to gel with. Um, and it's what stays in the case. There's a lot of turnover, like really, I can't stress that enough. I mean, every week I take at least a quarter of it out, replace it with other things, try them out. If they don't work, I get rid of them, you know. So anyone else? All right, well, somebody come up here and play this. <laughs> this is going to be awkward if nobody does it. <laughs> it's going to get really awkward. Come on, right? Yeah. I got to play yesterday. Yeah, yeah, you're all right. I'll play it. Yeah, come on. It's long. We're waiting for you. You're waiting for me? Yeah. I have no idea what we're doing. So yeah, just mixer, right? That was late. Okay, that was sorry. That's what we're doing. See, do we get through? Right, so that's just getting... Is it that's my house goes like right in? Yeah, right?
cosplayer so that I'm wiring is on. Nah, I'm Yeah, it's a nice graphic. Yeah, I just finished doing Just the yellow ones? Okay. Um, wait, the yellow ones? Yeah. Wait, which yellow ones? Yeah, the long ones? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the power for the Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the power for the power for the power for the power the